This is Job chapter number 39, verse number 9. And we're going to look at <coughs> a very common uh, 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 you know, a word in the Bible, and, uh, or animal to be specific, that the mockers will scoff at. The atheists will mock and scoff at and make fun of. And I'm going to show you that they actually have no idea what this word means. That they actually have no clue what this particular animal actually is. And there's actually a vast misunderstanding even amongst Christians today of what this word means. But I'm going to prove to you and show you that a shadow of a doubt who this is speaking of. Or what this is speaking of. So, we're going to look at Job chapter number 39, verse number 9. Let me get there myself. Job chapter number 39, verse number 9. Right before the book of Psalms. Job chapter number 39. Verse number 9. Now this animal, if you, if you look down there, you probably saw who it was, but it's the unicorn, right? It's the unicorn, and, and, and I personally had atheists bring this, up my, uh, hurt, bring this up to myself before. I've heard in debates between like uh, Christians and atheists, They'll, the atheist will just like, he starts to maybe lose or something, he'll just like kind of throw that out there. Yeah, but what about the unicorn, buddy? Or something. He'll start mocking how the Bible mentions unicorns, right? Well... The modern definition, let me read, let's start this way. <coughs> the, if you look up in a dictionary, the modern definition in just a, this is a Webster's Dictionary, this is the definition of a unicorn. This is what it says. A mythical animal typically represented as a horse. So it will look like, a, it'll be a horse-like creature. Represented as a horse, and then it says, with a single straight horn projecting from its forehead, right? So it would be coming out of its forehead. And when I said unicorn, that's probably what you thought of, wasn't it? Everybody just popped in their mind just a picture of a rainbow with a unicorn running or something, right? And had a, 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 a big horn out of it, like a horse-like creature with a horn coming out. And this type of creature actually has been mentioned in like Greek mythology. It goes back to like Roman mythology. It's been mentioned in, in, uh, in like the Greek culture, if you will. So, a lot of people will wonder, even Christians will wonder, why is the word unicorn actually mentioned in my Bible? Well, I'm going to explain to you and show to you what a unicorn actually is. So, let's start by the Bible, right? Let's look at the Bible. Let's get the Bible's definition of what it is, not man's definition. So, let's look at Job chapter number 39, verse number 9 here. It says this, <coughs> Job chapter number 39, verse number 9. <coughs> Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee? Or abide by thy crib. Verse 10. Canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow? Or will he harrow the valleys after thee? Now, one of, one of the things that I want to look at real quickly is <coughs> I'm going to read you three other references. You stay here. I'm going to read you the three other references. I want to look at all of them of unicorn in the Bible. Here's Numbers chapter number 23, verse number 22. God brought them out of Egypt, and then it says this, He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. So notice what's being emphasized. We're going to identify this creature in a moment, but it says the strength of a unicorn, right? So it's a strong animal. Numbers 24, verse 8. God brought him forth out, out of Egypt, talking about Israel. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. So it's a strong animal. Now listen to what it says. He shall eat up the nations, his enemies, and shall break their bones and pierce them through with his arrows. So notice, in tandem with the, with the uh, unicorn, it's talking about it being a fierce animal that fights. He's talking about God fighting in another aspect, but he's comparing the two things. He has great strength, and then he's going to destroy them. Right? Look at uh, another review. Don't turn there. Psalm chapter number 92, verse number 10. But my horn shalt thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. Right? So he says, my horn you'll exalt like the horn of a unicorn, saying it of, with great strength. And then he says this, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. One thing, of course, that we see being emphasized is the strength. You know what else you see being emphasized is specifically is the strength of the horn that he has. One horn. The strength of his horn and just his strength in general. Now, when we read in, in chapter number 39, verse number 9 and 10, was there anything that just screamed, just horse with a horn? Anything at all? Anything that we've read at all, period? Nothing at all, right? Actually, it implies to me something very different. I'll point that out to you in just one other moment. But you know what's very interesting? When you read in Job chapter number 39, God actually goes through and mentions a bunch of creatures, a bunch of animals, right? 
None of them are mythical creatures. I want you to look here in verse number 1. Knowest thou the time when the wild goats of the rock bring forth? Is that a mythical creature? No, a goat is just a normal animal that we look around and see every day, right? Look at verse number 5. Who hath sent out the wild ass free? You know what a wild ass is? A donkey, a wild donkey. <coughs> look at verse number 13. Gavest thou the goodly wings unto the peacocks, or wings and feathers unto the ostrich? Are those, are those mythical creatures? Are those from Greek mythology? Are they just normal animals? You can go to a zoo and see all these animals today, can't you? A lot of people have farms and they'll possess a lot of these animals today. Look at, uh, I think I have one more here. Look at verse, verse number 19. Now we're going to bounce off of this. I'm going to prove to you right now that actually what was mentioned in verse number 9 and 10 is not a horse. Because look at what's mentioned in verse number 19. Hast thou given the horse strength? Hast thou clothed his neck with thunder? So notice what was actually mentioned in verse number 19. What was mentioned? A horse. A horse. So would it make sense? Notice he's not repeating animals either. Would it make sense that he would previously have mentioned a horse and then now we're just going to mention a horse again? Further, let's prove that it's not because notice that different characteristics are, are, are given to the horse right now than were given to what we read just a moment ago. Look at verse 19. Hast thou given the horse strength? Hast thou clothed his neck with thunder? Canst thou make him afraid as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. Now look at verse 21. He paused in the valley and rejoiceth in his strength. He goeth on to meet the armed men. So how is he going on to, eat, to meet the armed men? This is very important. Because he is being ridden by a man. And what's happening? He's taking him forth into battle. You understand? So he's going forth to meet the armed men in the battle. Now look at verse 22. <coughs> he mocketh that fear and is not affrighted, neither turneth he back from the sword. The quiver rattleth against him, the glittering spear and shield. Now, so notice that this is referring to war. He's being ridden forth into war. Has that animal been domesticated? Yes. It has. It's being used, isn't it, in some way? The man is using it, isn't he? Go back to verse number 9 now. Let's look at the unicorn. Let's see what it's actually explaining. Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee or abide by thy crib? Now, can you say that about a horse? Yeah. You can say that about a horse, can't you? Now, I want you to think about this. I don't know if you know this or not, but if you look up, what is the most common agricultural engine? It's a horse. And it, the engine doesn't have to be mechanical. It's just any sort of animal that's being used, like even on donkeys and everything. The most common animal that is even still used today to, to furrow and harrow land is... A horse. Notice what it's saying about, about this particular animal. It says in verse 9, Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee? Saying, will he listen to you? Does the horse listen? Was he listening to the rider? Was he going where he wanted him to go? He was, wasn't he? Notice the ma major difference between the two animals. Look at the end part portion of this, verse 10. Canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow? Now, is it, is it, is it, I don't know if everyone's familiar with what a furrow is. It can be, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a noun as in something that you can do, but it's also you know, like an instrument. It's like a harrow. People know what harrows are because that's what's mentioned next. It's with the wheels, the big thing that you'll see animals dragging behind them and it's plowing the ground. It's connected to the back of the animal and it's this big instrument and it's just, it's just basically plowing up the ground. It's tearing up the dirt. That's a harrow. Or furrow is very sim similar. But a furrow actually digs like a, a small pit, just one individual pit, because you go through and plant seeds and then you cover it up. Everyone understand what I'm saying? That's what a furrow is. So that's the difference. The harrow is a longer instrument with like wheels, and it'll dig into the ground. And then the furrow is, is just one single individual like line or straight, you know, line of, of, of an instrument or different type of, of uh, mechanical, you know, uh, uh, tools, and it just digs just a pit. And then you can plant something in, like I said, and then you just fill it back in. Now, horses are used for that constantly. That, they're the most common agricultural engine, if you look it up. The most common you know, resource that people will go to is not even, even still today, it's not even a, mechan not even a John Deere or whatever. It's a, even a, it's a horse today. How much more so in the past? And what does he say about this animal? Yeah. Verse 10, one more time. Canst thou buy the unicorn with his band? That's obviously the band or the strap that would go around the animal that connects to the furrow. Do you do that to horses? Yes, you do. Canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow? Or will he harrow the valleys after thee? 
This is what horses are used for constantly. It's the most common animal that's used for this. So is it possible that we're talking about a horse? No. no. These are rhetorical questions. Saying, I can get him to do these things. I'm the creator is what God's, God is saying. But can you get him to do this? Can you get him to, can you get the, will the unicorn, you know, abide in your crib? Saying like in your, if you were to go to your barn, you have a little area for the animals, right? Can, will the unicorn do that for you? No, he won't, will he? That's the answer. Will he serve you? No, he won't. Saying he would serve me, that's what God is saying. It's a rhetorical question to show God is, God is interrogating Job here, and he's, he's expressing his greatness unto Job, saying, I can get the animals to do all these things. I created all these animals. Right? So notice, it's, we can prove by this one mention of the unicorn that it is not a horse. It's not possible for it to be a horse. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you what the unicorn is. And then I'm going to show you and prove to you what the unicorn is. And I want you to keep this in mind of what we just read. Number one, notice this, it is an animal that cannot be domesticated. And it is an animal that has one horn and it has great strength. When we look around at the world today, there's only one animal that this could apply to. You know what animal it is? A rhinoceros. It's the only animal, when you look around at the world today, that has not been domesticated. That it has great strength and that possesses one horn. Now, some people may say, <coughs> well, I thought, you know, rhinos had two horns. Well, there are different species of rhinos, of course. Like the most common, the reason why people think that is because the most common rhinoceroses have two horns, like the Sumatran rhino. That's the one you see at the zoo almost all the time. Then there's the white rhino, you know, the black rhino. There's the, the, uh, the, the what is it called about his lip? The hook lip rhino, the hook lip rhino, where his lip like comes out real weird. And then you have the round head or, or round uh, cheek, something like that, round face rhino, where he has his, his head like rounds real weird, like that. All those rhinos are the most common rhinos. We go to zoos a lot, all right? If you want a rhino. I used to like like read and memorize the stuff at the zoo. We used to all, I love rhinos too, by the way. So <clears throat> but here's the thing. When you when you look up rhinos, when they're classified, if you ever do go to the zoo and you read those little plaques or you talk to the curator, that's the person that shows you the exhibit, they, they will oftentimes not refer to them as rhinoceroses. You know, they'll refer to them as by their Latin name. Because most animals are actually classified when they're studied by their Latin name. Now, do you know what all those rhinos that I just referred to as a moment ago are, are, are actually called, you know, the ones that possess two horns? Does anyone know what they're called? You know, uh, you know, it starts with a, you know, with a B. I'll give you a hint. Bicornis, exactly. Bicornis, just like you know, bi meaning two, like a bicycle because it has two wheels and sickles like cycle, right? So, you know, bicornis it means two, and cornis, you know, comes from the word horn, saying that it has two horns. Now, the animals that have one horn. The rhinoceros is all the species of animals, the most common being the, the uh, Asian rhino, I believe it is, and the Indian, I know for a fact, only has one. But I believe the Asian and the Indian both only have one horn. Do you know what they're referred to as in their Latin name? Unicornis. That's what they're called. They're called the unicornis. If you go and you look at the, uh, if you go and you look and I've seen this, this is where I, this is actually what first sent me on this. I, I grew up in the Cincinnati area. We used to go to the Cincinnati Zoo all the time. And I have been, you know, I have dedicated my life to the Lord. And, and when I was around 21, I got saved when I was like 12. I started serving God. About two years after, I was really into studying my Bible. We were at the zoo one day. And I was just constantly thinking, what is a unicorn? You know, I was reading my Bible. I saw it popping up all the time. What is a unicorn? You know, and one day I was at the zoo. And I don't know if my wife remembers this or not. But I, like I said, I read the blacks and everything. And then I noticed one of the animals, one of the, one of the rhinos was actually referred to as Something by Cornish. And I was like, what? And I thought about that. I was like, of course, that's Latin. You know, and I was like, well, why? Because there's two. And I was like, and it popped in my mind. Do you know what one would be? Unicornis. And I pulled out my phone and started doing some research. And then I looked it up more. And there's a lot more information about this. So, notice a moment ago, I read the definition from a modern Webster's Dictionary of what, it, what people say that a unicorn is today. What was it? A mythical horse-like creature with a, you know, a horn projecting out of its forehead, right? 
But if you go to an 1828 dictionary, remember your King James Bible was translated in 1611. So if you go to a dictionary, the Webster's Dictionary, the same company that printed the dictionary that we just got that definition from a moment ago, that was printed in 1828. This is the only the, the only definition pertaining to this animal. There's another, another one about a sea unicorn. But listen <clears throat> to what unicorn meant in 1828. An animal with one horn, the monoceros. This name is often applied to the rhinoceros. So if you look up the definition of a unicorn in an 1828 dictionary, of what it actually meant right after the King James Bible was translated, someone sat down to read their Bible and they read the word unicorn. Do you know what? If they opened up, hey, let's look at a dictionary. Do you know what the dictionary would tell you that it was? A rhinoceros. Now, even maybe even more interesting than that, if you look up in that same dictionary, just look up the word rhinoceros, it says this, a genus of quadrupeds of two species, one of which... The unicorn as a, as a single horn growing almost erect from the nose. The animal when full grown is said to be 12 feet in length. There's another species with two horns, the bicornis. They are natives of Asia and Africa. So notice, you look up unicorns and it's like it's a rhino. You look up rhino or rhino, <coughs> rhinoceros, what does it tell you it is? It's a unicorn. Notice that in the 1828 dictionary. So you know what has happened? From 1828 to 2018, the definition has been corrupt. It's been changed. Further proof of that, this is actually what I was referring to a minute ago. This is extremely interesting. This is, this is extremely interesting. So, if anyone familiar with the Latin Vulgate, that is the Catholic Bible, right? The Latin Vulgate is the Catholic Bible. So, if you look, the, <coughs> if you look up the verses in the Latin Vulgate, which is where that name comes from. Where our word today, unicorn and bi, you know, a unicorn comes from, it's unicornis. That's a Latin word. So if you look it up in the Latin Bible, all of those verses where a unicorn shows up, you know what it says? All these different things. When these guys are a bunch of idiots when it comes to the Bible, is what the facts are. They don't even, why don't you, if you want to mock the Bible, don't try to pretend and act like you've done your due diligence when it comes to, hey, I looked at the Bible and the word unicorn is mentioned. Therefore, I reject the Bible. Well, what, is the, what does the word unicorn actually mean? Maybe, why don't we look it up? You know what? You know what happens every time when you really study out the words of the Bible? And when you really do your due diligence? The Bible comes out on top every single time. It makes perfect sense. It lines up. So do you know when we're reading through Job chapter number 39, and we see all these animals being mentioned, they're all what? They're all factual animals that we can all look around and see today. And do you know what Job 39 verse 9 and 10, when God's speaking to Job? Now think about a, now think about a rhino when you see a unicorn. What he says... Would the, would the rhino, let's say that, would the rhino be willing to serve thee? Are you going to bind him and put him in your crib? Are you, no, he says, he says are, are you gonna, is he going to abide by thy crib? And then he tells him, you know, in, uh, in verse number 10, he tells him, you know, are you going to put a band on him and get him to furrow? And, you know, and, and get him to harrow the ground? Is that possible? No. So does, what, you know how, how much sense it makes when you look at it as a rhino? Now, here's the only objection. And I believe this for a little while, and probably a lot of people here probably have heard a lot of that information, maybe not all of it. But I brought it up. <coughs> I brought it up to a lot of people and persuaded a lot of people to my view on this. And there was one person that gave me uh, some pushback on it. And he was really stuck on this being like a horse-like animal. And I was like, well, what's your proof of that? You know, from the Bible. And he didn't have anything besides this. In Psalm chapter number 29, verse number 6. Let's go to Psalm chapter 29, verse number 6. It's, it's just one book forward. Psalm chapter number 29, verse number 6. He looked up all the verses and he came back to me. He already, <laughs> he already wanted it to be a horse-like creature because he didn't have this verse when he was, when he was kind of giving me pushback. Then he went home and he looked up all these verses. And this, and this guy ended up being a missionary and went over to Africa. I mean, that actually ties with, into the story here in just a moment. But look at Psalm chapter 29, verse number 6. Notice what it says here. He maketh them also to skip like a calf, Lebanon and Syrian, like a young unicorn. So he said to me, like, notice how it's referred to, and he says, like a calf. And I was like, yeah, but here's the thing, buddy. A calf is just a young 
animals. You know what rhinos are called too? When they're born? Cats. Yeah. And you know what that rhino is also referred to elsewhere? It calls them a bullock. If you, I think I read that verse actually. You know what a grown male rhino is called? A bull. That's what a grown male rhino is called. So all of those actually apply just as well for my theory, right? And he's like, but also look at that. It says it skips. It skips like a unicorn. He's like, unicorns don't skip. You ever looked up videos about unicorns? So I looked up videos about unicorns. And I was like, ah, I don't know. That same guy went to Africa. Do you know what's in Africa? <laughs> Rhinos. <laughs> he calls me up one day over WhatsApp. And he's like, dude, I had to call you. He's like, I just saw a baby rhino run by me. And he said it was the perfect definition of skipping. <laughs> he, said, he said, I am 100% sold that a rhino, that a unicorn rhino is a rhino. I am 100% sold. And I actually, he actually got that argument from someone else, is where he got that argument. But here's the thing. When you look at it being a horse-like creature, you can debunk that from that angle, number one. You can see that the horse is mentioned in the context. Then you can see that the horse is actually being domesticated in the context, and this animal is not. And repeatedly, the great strength is mentioned about this animal, saying he's got greater strength than all these other animals, greater strength than the horse. And he cannot be domesticated. We look around at the world where rhino is the only animal that meets that, that qualification. Then we look up, actually, when the King James Bible was translated, 200 years after even, and the definition is still rhino. You look up rhino, and, right, and I don't know if you thought about this, but actually when it says rhinoceros in 1828 dictionary, in that context it just refers to the rhino casually as a unicorn. Also known as a unicorn. Saying that that's what it's still being called today. Then, you look up the Latin Vulgate, and all the times almost, not every time, uh, it, <coughs> it's translated as unicornis or unicornium. That's plural in, in Latin when it's not I-U-M or something like that. But then it's translated as, sometimes as this, rhinoceros or rhinocerium in their Bible, which I believe the King James Bible is perfect. Amen. You, rhino and unicorn mean the same thing, just like they meant the same thing in 1828. So I don't need that to be, you know, that's not a proof to me from the English text. But what I can do is look at the language in which that word came from, and we can see what that word means in its original language. And, and in a Bible that's translated into Latin, where the word unicorn came from. So that word derives from Latin. Where it came from Latin, if you look up that word in the Latin Bible, they'll translate that same word in their language as unicorn and rhino both in the Latin Vulgate. Look it up if you don't believe me. Go on Bible Gateway, type in all, type in unicorn, and then pull up the Latin Vulgate in the language of Latin, and you'll see it plain and simple, unicornis, unicornium, rhinoceros, rhinocerium. Over and over and over again. So as I said... The King James Bible, every time, comes out correct. So this is, this is a, uh, something to learn about this. When you read the Bible and something like is daunting to you, it can bother you, and you're like, what in the world? Why are the unicorns being mentioned in the Bible? Do your due diligence. Study out the Bible. Right. You know, look up every time that word is mentioned and see, <clears throat> is this telling me that this is a horse? I didn't even need to do all of that other, all those other things. I could have went to Job 39. I can see in the context it's not a horse. We could use the Bible as our definition. Look around the world today. There's only one animal, only one that fits the, the uh, description that's given of the unicorn. And it's clearly, and without a shadow of a doubt, a rhinoceros.